You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight, that question would have to be, Mark, will one day on Australia's Great Ocean Road allow you to capture the majesty of Australia's rugged shoreline, or will going coastal just send you postal? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. <laughs> Day two of my exploration of Victoria. That's the Australian state, not the Crown Princess of Sweden, Duchess of Vastagotland. I wasn't mapping the terrain of a Royal Highness, rather the rugged shores of Australia's south, wending my way along the Great Ocean Road between Aries Inlet and Port Ferry. And the day started auspiciously. The great celestial unicorn must have been on the booze the night before because the sky was spewing rainbows and the conditions were more changeable than a stripper's wardrobe, moderating the harsh daytime light that would have otherwise inevitably have dominated the magic of the scenery. Every parking bay was an opportunity to pull up the car, get out, urinate discreetly, scan the coastline for interesting features, and then usually get back in the car, feeling dejected in the inadequacy of my skills as a coastal photographer. Now, in case you don't know yet, I'm not normally usually one with nature. Normally, I'm at sixes and sevens, preferring the brutal formality of the man-made world to the fickle disposition of the natural world. And this wasn't any different at first, but whether there was some lucky leprechaun at the end of the rainbow guiding me to photographic pots of gold, or I was simply enough out of my element to notice the beauty in rough granite, I soon arrived at a location that kind of resembled a lunar landscape rather than any terrestrial beach. The rocks were rutted and the surface stretching out to the ocean was pockmarked like a syphilitic duke from the Enlightenment period. Inspired by the weirdness of it all, I set out to record the alien vista. If I'm going to be honest, these were some of my favorites for the day. Shooting into the light washed the color out of the scene, and I loved the glistening reflections and odd shapes. Shooting away from the sun didn't really yield the same magic. I loved this photo of the surfer as an incongruous juxtaposition to the landscape. I really liked the wave crashing, creating a natural part of the image and providing a contrast to the human form. This one wasn't quite so successful, I think. The blue is too strong and maybe it works better in black and white or maybe I could have cropped the base of the image a bit more. I don't know. 
you tell me. And while you're at it, since you've made it this far, like, subscribe, and do all of that goodness that keeps me coming back here for external validation to shore up the emptiness of my existence. Anyway, with my desire for preternatural moon rocks temporarily satiated, it was time to move on to Granda Vistas, inland for a bit, and faced with the lush greenery of Pastureland. I threw up the drone and hoped it didn't fall. Fortunately, I turned it on first, so it floated in the air the way a brick doesn't and let me explore the rolling hills of a place called Barnum Paradise Scenic Reserve. I think calling it paradise is overstating it a bit, not quite Nirvana, but definitely a couple of stops above the Coldplay song. It did kind of remind me of sentimental British TV shows about quaint villages or Yorkshire vets, none of which I have the music copyright for, so insert your own All Creatures Great and Small theme here while I take in the undulating fecundity of the Victorian countryside. Are we done yet? Good. No photos worth speaking of here. I tried to go for layers with this shot, but it became more of a bad Billie Eilish knockoff hairstyle than a tasty tiramisu. The brown fern element dominated the picture and led to a diffuse muddy mess in the background. Actually, I think this stitched together drone shot is more interesting even if the overly sharpened JPEG artifacting is like a knife attack to the eyes. But that wasn't the main event. As we moved back to the coast, this is where the Great Ocean Road really started to reveal its promise, although its promise is one of loss and decay. The southern Victorian coastline is crumbling. Its limestone cliff faces are battered by the Southern Ocean, causing the edges to disintegrate like a stale digestive. The stacks were originally known as the Pinnacles, which completely rips off the name of an equally spectacular and much more local phenomenon, at least local to me, remote to most. Click here if you want to see more of me failing to bring the magic of photography to the magic of nature. The stacks were also known as the Sow and Pigs, with the Sow being the larger rock, Muttonbird Island, but most recently and most widely, we know it today as the Twelve Apostles. And that's something of a misnomer too on several levels. Not only are they not the primary disciples of Christ, but there have only ever been nine of them. An abject lie then, and one that I can only assume happened under Scott Morrison's watch as head of Tourism Australia. Still, even Google seemingly isn't able to count to 12 properly, so we'll just gloss over that shortfall. Particularly now there are only eight, with one of them collapsing in July 2005. And while over time coastal erosion will mean the creation of new stacks, I haven't got the patience to wait around a few millennia for that decisive moment. It's hard to argue too that you're getting your money's worth when you realize that you can only see six of them in the classic view. But hey, let's try and make a silk purse out of this particular sow and pig's ear.
And let's be honest, I'm not mapping new territory here. This location has been shot a million times before and there are obviously many who have had their Insta moment in front of this set of pillars. Like this lovely lady and her loyal familiar. No doubt her heart will go on, but I figured we could be another apostle down if I left it too late. I quickly shot a row of images and ended up with this very unimpressive set of stills. And now to do my own turd polishing, to do this iconic location justice, or at the very least produce something that won't compete with the millions of other photos taken here, but can at least communicate something of my experience of it. All right, so there we have a few images which I have put into a row. How many have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine images. Now I could do this directly in Lightroom, photo merging into a panorama, but I think if we go to edit in, I'll do it in Photoshop simply because I do have access to that. And I'll go to merge to panorama in Photoshop. I haven't noticed too much of a difference between the two. Um, and I will say, to be honest, that I find that Lightroom is quicker, but my experience generally is that the tools are a little bit better in Photoshop, a bit more refined than they tend to be in Lightroom. So I'm going to choose an auto layout and see what it gives me in the first instance. And maybe we'll just speed this up a little bit. Really, really ugly, ugly images. No contrast, no color, just bright, sunny day and a little bit hazy as well. Obviously, I shot all of these with the same exposure. And obviously, as you can probably tell here, not with a tripod. I hate tripods. Oh, some images could not be automatically aligned. That's not good. Yeah, yeah, no, that doesn't work. So what the hell? Okay, well, let's delete that one. Let's go back to Lightroom. So if it didn't work in Photoshop, let's see if Lightroom itself can do a better job. Doesn't let me choose automatic, but it does let me flick between spherical, cylindrical and perspective. Obviously, these tend to relate to whether you're doing a 360, whether you're doing a panorama or whether you're simply stacking images in a kind of horizontal way. And that works fine. Okay. All right, actually not so bad, but I think that there's certain things that I would like to do to fix that. First of all, let's bring up the develop module and apply my own favorite quasi code Chrome look to it. That hasn't made a huge amount of difference, but that's not a bad thing. Oh, it has done a little bit. I've lost a lot of my yellows and I think I need to fix that. Um, let's add a little bit more yellow to it. Okay, let's hide the before and after. And let's see what else we can do to fix this up. Well, I, I think it's a little bit blue, so I add some yellow. That doesn't help with the sky, where it loses most of its color, but still, we do have some sky definition, which I wasn't sure we were going to be able to get. Obviously, those shadows need a bit of work. If we lift the shadows, that actually produces an interesting image. I don't hate that, but that's not what I was originally going to go for. Plan to be a more generalized, sort of slightly painterly take on the standard look of the thing. So I think I need to pull those down. And I think that works a little bit better. I think we can up the uh, maybe reduce the contrast a little bit. That looks okay. I wonder if I select the sky. What can I do to the sky? All right, it's a reasonably good approximation of the sky. I just want to put a little bit of tint in there. Put some of that blue back maybe. Or maybe not. I'm 
just lower that exposure a tiny bit. That's okay. I'm not going to get much definition out of those stacks. Let me, let's make sure that at least my horizon is straight because I'm not convinced that it is at this stage. Yeah, maybe it is. It's not too bad. I think it does need, generally it needs a bit more contrast. Yeah, I'll lift some of those shadows, some of those highlights, but maybe actually just add a little bit more contrast to the image. All right, let's go into the colors. And pick some of those oranges. See where they go. If I make them a little bit more orange, it's not too bad. Saturation, way too much. I will lighten them a little bit though. Perhaps add a little bit more texture. Tiny bit of clarity. I'm very wary of the clarity slider. I like the look of it, but as you can see, a little bit less clarity sometimes produces more of a painterly effect. In fact, I think with upping the texture a bit more, I might actually bring some of the clarity back down. Dehaze, oh, do I want it? No. More haze actually does make it a little bit more painterly. I think I'll do that. I want more of the green than the brown. Actually, there's more green in there. Uh, it's more like the colors I'm after. I think the yellows look a bit more lateral. Make it a bit lighter. Yeah, I like that. Very subtle. I think that's a definite improvement. What I don't like is what it does around the shore. So I'm going to brush in something around the water. I won't auto mask. I find that can be a bit distracting. And this really is about just trying to bring a bit more contrast, I think, to this and maybe got a little bit lightened. So if I and the exposure of the contrast a bit too much there we go always do too much and then you'll know that you do need to pull back okay point three maybe enough with the colors you know I don't even know that that needs that much more work So there you have it, one photo with bad light to join the millions of other photos of the eight apostles taken from the exact same location. But hey, who needs originality? I am the monkey randomly hammering away at a typewriter in the vain hope that given enough time and enough variations, eventually I'll produce Shakespeare. In any case, it was a sight to behold and while I wouldn't say that any of the images I took along that stretch of coastline are worthy of the cover of National Geographic, it was a pretty good reminder of the ferocity of nature.
In many of these images, it's clear how the relentless pounding of the waves is going to take its toll over time. This is London Bridge, of course not that London Bridge, but well named for a change since in 1990, the central arch of this one fell down too. Ultimately, I found the best way to try and bring a bit of originality to the coastline was to less focus on the what of the landscape I was shooting, rather to try and just evoke something, using it as a strange and fascinating backdrop. I do like this one simply because your eye is drawn not so much to the rocks themselves, but to the contrast between the stark silhouette of the bird and the dreaminess of the overall scene. Of course, it would have been more harmonious to have the bird in the air rather than interrupting the horizon, but that bird wasn't taking directions. And I don't know, actually one of the things I like about it is that slightly uncomfortable composition and the weird light and silhouette giving it a kind of prehistoric feel. I don't get the sense of this as your typical tourist photo of the Great Ocean Road, and maybe that's just because it's crap, but I find myself looking at it again and again. So you tell me, maybe it does have something. Arriving at Port Ferry provided a tonal counterpoint to the fierceness of the Victorian coastline, kind of a lyrical pastoral to give you some relief from the cacophony of the wind, water and erosion. The sunset brought some more interesting light and a sense of calm, though not without its weirdness too. Lots of quite typical coastal shots, but I did come across an interesting building set back from the beach. I think there's definitely something at play between the formal lines of the building and the soft clouds, particularly with the darker cloud so prominent in the center. I raised the shadows to give the edges of the walls a bit of a stronger definition and enhance the contrast a little bit. This one is a focus stack of two images. I deliberately wanted the sharp, rugged foreground and a clean, crisp horizon, so that your eye has to choose between the rough rocks and the smooth grass. I also like this weird little edifice here. Despite the sculpted horizon, there's definitely some kind of timeless quality. You could imagine this being a series of Saxon or Celtic burial mounds denoted by that strange frame. Of course, it could also just be a series of golf course bunkers. But speaking of weirdness, the final images were snagged by the side of the road when driving back to the motel.
This is very much a build your own story happening. Whether Odysseus retired to Australia and left his Trojan horse at the front to sit on bricks like an old rusty ute, I don't know. But you have to admit the horse is an intriguing addition to the frame and elevates a fairly mundane Australian scene to some kind of Greek mythic status. Which brings me to some kind of rambling conclusion. Did I capture the majesty of the landscape? No, not really. And what would be the point anyway? This is a region documented by myriad postcards, Instagram shots, and those panoramic landscape art prints that you can buy from pop-up galleries in large shopping centers. I don't want to compete with that. And while I did the obligatory eight little pigs photograph, that's not the one that really resonates with me. The best ones to me were the weird, the alien, the intimate, or the ambiguous. Lonely surfers, pterodactyls, Celtic burial mounds, or just strange shit dumped outside the fronts of old Australian houses. They were the ones that drew my attention in the first place and still make me want to look at them again, scratching my head and filling the negative space with concocted stories about people, place and time. I guess it's not what a photo reveals that is its power, but how it invites you into its sketchily outlined world to inhabit it and draw your own conclusions. And if your conclusion is that there's still some merit in this photographic journey, then don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you later.